Hey out there Akronites, welcome once again to Around Akron with Blue Green. And I want to thank you for joining me here in my den of Akron, where I read, where I research, and I plan out future episodes of Around Akron with Blue Green. But enough about that. This episode is an amazing episode. We're going to visit some really neat people. I'm going to head over to the CNC Training Center and learn all about this amazing school where they teach you to make just about anything from a blueprint and a machine that you program. I'm going to head down to Blueberry Hill to meet up with the grizzled wizard of Waste Not, Want Not, P.R. Miller, and see what he's been up to. I meet up with Jared Lees and talk all about his custom-made knives. Now this is an amazing segment you're going to want to see. Now to kick this show off today, we're going to meet up with Scott Fox and talk about his 30 years at working at Acme, what he does there, and his up-and-coming photography book. Let's go see what Scott Fox is all about. Like 10 years old and I got a, one of the throwaway cameras. Pictures didn't turn out the way I wanted it to, so I had to go back and re- get a better camera. That's when I got, when the digital cameras came along, I decided to go that route. And I was down at the, down at the Stuff Emporium, I saw their camera, they had to, you know, they want too much for that, so I went down, to, all the way down to, down at the bomb shelter, they had one I wanted. One one looked like almost like something like Paul McCartney had, but couldn't get that one. It's not for sale, just for look. I said, then he had a nine, and then I saw a nine dollar one right next door to it. I got it, that camera. That's the digital camera. It, you mean video film? You can film it. You're, you can film your stuff. You can film it and and all that. But you got to have the right film cartridge for it. Journey into into a writer's and photographer's mind. That's why I named the new book. It looked like I'm standing there at at Treehouse Point. I had my sister-in-law take that picture for me with my cameras, you know. And then I did everything else to the picture. It looked like some somebody stalking me up there. That's like you up there stalking me. <laughs> I said I had to do that. Everybody said, "Oh, look, somebody stalking you." I said, "Yeah, somebody come down." One of the owners of the showing off the tour, you know come down there and didn't know, realize I was getting pictures taken. That's the one one I didn't take, so I had, can't claim that one. My caseworker talked to my brothers. Hey, we got a surprise for Scott. Let's interview him. Here he's been there for 30 years. We want to get that in the, in the can so, we can so he can get, we went to Starbucks to do this. We signed papers. My brother signed paper, make sure it's okay with this. Who do anything you need him to do? We pick, we'll call his boss and let him know we're coming in to take photos. You know, I said, we can come in 10 minutes earlier than I need to, you know, we'll do a photo shoot that way. I thought, that was, I like that idea. I'm showing myself inside that people don't know about me. Since then, if you go to Akron Life, it's inside an advertisement for October. And okay, we stayed until November. No, November was November issue, and on Billboard, I got like 5,000 followers because of that. I do packing, groceries, I do what sometimes they need stock, you know, put things back on the shelf and that, you know, cleanups, things like that. I like to be, I like doing packing, because packing, you get to meet people, talk to people, you know, you, when you carry out, they'll ask, hey, how's work going for you? Oh, I heard you're going to do this and that, you know. I said, yeah, oh, yeah, you heard that. Yeah, we're friends. Okay, we be friends on Facebook since you made that billboard. I said, yes, you can. They're asking me when I'm going to retire. I said, don't know yet. I'm, not, I'm too young. I'm 48 years old. Can't retire that age. Employees, customers, friends, rock stars, you know, ask me, when are you going to retire? Can't retire just yet. Not time to, not time to retire yet. If I could, I would, you know. Someday, my, if my photograph book does well, I want to put a book together where it has a story behind, behind the man. That's me. If you're taking photographs, keep on trying until you get to what you need. If you don't like what you've done, if the person you took the picture of didn't like the way it's done, have them sit with you and talk what you want to do on that photo, how it wasn't done. I'm on Facebook, I'm on this and that, and people said, ah, you're not, you're just, just a hobby. I said, no, it's not a hobby. To me, it's actually what I want to do. 
So I was working for a grocery store. I wanted to be a photographer. Get a book out showing people my work, what I can do for out and about. Never done that before. I said, it's time to get into photographing. Next up is the CNC Training Center. I'm gonna sit down and learn all about their school. It's a short program, doesn't cost a whole lot of money, and there's a 95% chance you're gonna get a good paying job once you get done with the program. Let's go see what the CNC Training Center is all about. I actually really enjoy my job because I know the outcome that's waiting for them, even if they don't believe it when they first come in. But I've seen it so many times over 13 years, the outcomes of students and the jobs that they get that I want to transfer that enthusiasm to them during their four months and then when they actually get their job and their new career path, nothing feels better for me than to know that I had a part in them who made a commitment to be able to make a living the rest of their life and take care of their family. So not, not many people get to do that. The program is a four month program and the students will learn hands-on machinery. So they'll learn a CNC mill and a CNC lathe. They'll learn to operate it. And then we have a classroom with computers where we teach related materials such as math, blueprint reading, but we also teach them to program the machines because they are programmed by um, computer language, which we teach them. I, I think what the, the young people need to know today about this business, it's not like maybe they had read about or heard about from the past where it was like these dirty dingy factories places are clean the equipment's clean it's it's a really much cleaner environment and much safer environment than it used to be years ago we didn't have all the safety precautions that we have now the machines today you can't even open the door on them while they're running they got lockouts on them it's really really getting to be high tech and if they want to get themselves involved in it, get into the programming end of it, working with the computers all the time. It's very rewarding. And I've always, what I've always liked is it's extremely rewarding when you take a piece of paper that's got something drawn on it and you make that finished product and you've got something you can look at that you actually did. And uh, it's very satisfying. There's actually 1,100 machining companies within an hour radius of the city of Akron and those companies are very busy and their number one problem is a lack of skilled workers. So we're trying to meet the needs of companies to provide employees but we're additionally trying to meet the needs of the students who want long-term employment once they're done training. It's just a wide variety in what we call a job shop. We don't have a specific product line that we make. We make stuff for everybody. And it, the variety is really nice because you don't get bored. It's just changing all the time. You may run five little pieces tomorrow, and the day after that you'll have something that's 100 something totally different. And uh, it just keeps you on your toes. We can make anything from uh pieces and parts for airplanes, uh, bolts, pins for brakes, and I mean, just imagine making a pin for an airplane that's, that goes into the brakes that stops the plane. You know, I, I want them to be just right. We make stuff like that. We make pretty much anything that you see that's made out of metal, we pretty much make. Uh, all my jobs really been job shops, so it's not really a production where you're just making thousands and thousands of the same part. Uh, pretty much the stuff we do is uh, where companies have a hard time doing it, they send it to us for us to brainstorm a way to do it and uh, make the parts for them. We do uh, screws, bolts, rotors, all kind of, we do pretty much anything that's made out of metal. We pretty much uh, machine, and I'm talking about even pieces for our machines when they break. We pretty much make those parts and put the machines back together, so it's a busy, <laughs> a busy job. try to figure out anything. Anything I see, I try to figure out a way to machine it. Whether I'm at Walmart, save a lot, it don't matter. I'm always looking to see how, not only how I will machine it, but the best way I would machine it and 
uh, what material I would use and um, speeds, fees. I mean, it's it's a constant thinking thing. So yeah, I, I, I look at the schematics of anything and think about how I can put it together and that makes it exciting for me. The type of person that wants to do this for a living is generally a busy active doer. Yes, you are going to operate machinery and so you have to enjoy the hands-on component. You don't interestingly have to be mechanically inclined because we're not fixing the machines in our industry, we're actually making something. So you have to take pride in the fact that you started with a maybe a plain piece of steel and a blueprint and then you created something that could be in a jet or the military or a car. So you have to you know, take pride in your work and the precision of it. It can appeal to a lot of different personalities, but they, they definitely have to be a busy active doer. And many of them obviously going to become promoted and own companies and become foremen, inspectors, computer programmers full time. So there's other jobs they can get uh, down the road. And I, I think anybody would, that gets into it and really applies themselves, it's unlimited how far you can go. I take a trip down to Blueberry Hill to visit the grizzled wizard of waste not what not, P.R. Miller. I visit the junk man, artist, and wizard and see what this guy is all about. Destiny. What am I doing here and why am I living and do I have a purpose in life and basically how did I get into this mess to begin with? Destiny. Everyone has one but way too many people never question it. They never question anything. They, they just go about their daily grind of doing what they're told to do, when they're told to do, pursuing the in God we trust American almighty dollar. They are called muggles. They come in all shapes, sizes, colors, inclinations, and ages. They are everywhere. They are deluded. They are dangerous, they are dumb. And if they don't wake up soon, we are all doomed. I, I have three identities. I'm a junk man. My job is to recycle. I am an artist. My job is to alter the viewer's reality. And I am a wizard, and my function as a wizard is to observe the flow of energy and direct it to its proper place, be it the light or the dark, to the best of my capacities and capabilities. Several years ago, several momentous things happened to me as a result of being prosecuted. Number one, uh, a movie was made about me by a guy named Josh Gippen, uh, the grizzled wizard of waste not want not. So that was earth changing if for no other reason than it brought me into publicity. And that was a direct, a direct result of that particular movie was that the Akron Public Library commissioned me to do the frog in front of the library in Highland Square. So that was kind of earth changing because people are like, wait a minute, this guy's a junk man. How can he be an artist? Well, I am both. And I might add very proudly so. I was named the artist in residence of Stan Hewitt right after the prosecution ended and all the alleged junk went to Stan Hewitt for a year. I had 125 of my giant flowers all over Stan Hewitt's garden. Since then, I've been the artist in residence at Walsh University, Mountain Union College, the Cleveland Botanical Gardens. And um, about 10 years ago, I got an opportunity to move to Loudonville to a 175 acre farm called Blueberry Hill. We have 15 acres of organic pick your own blueberries. 
Um, and it is quite tranquil here, quite different than living on the ambulance route in Akron, you know, and constantly the police are going by and all this other garbage. So I'm, I'm at the point now where the, the farm has been pretty well put together and I am very seriously contemplating how to re-enter the art scene in Akron. I've been doing this all my life because I grew up in a junkyard. As a child, the town dump was my playground. And because we didn't have any money, it was you make do with whatever you have. And uh, mother was very much into use your imagination because Basically, your imagination is the most important thing that you shall ever have because it is your map to your future. So I've always taken things that people throw away and say, gee, that looks like a flower or that looks like a part of a bug or those are wings or whatever it is. So my whole life has just evolved, uh, one, one could say quite factually that I have 72 years of experience in recycling. Before it was called recycling, you know, uh, that's a modern term. It is all a question of exploring the unknown through the use of your imagination. Your imagination is the most important thing that you will ever have because it is your map to your future including tomorrow. When, I, when Josh did this movie and the director of the library, hey, we need, you, we need you to do a piece, and right beside you there is a picture of the frog in front of the Highland Square Library. I still consider that to be probably the best piece I've ever done. So, and it was also the last major piece I did before I left Akron. Now that I'm down here, I'm also slowly getting back into the metal. I did a 20-foot tall uh, set of flowers out here at the driveway. I've uh, got a bug that is across the driveway there that's, uh, I, I did it a while ago, but I'm redoing it, you know. Um, I, I have no qualms about taking an old piece of art and reworking it into something different. So, you know, the world is, is my oyster of raw materials and so I don't care if it's metal or glass or plastic or wood or whatever it is you know if, it, if it's if it's a shape that catches my eye and inspires me or juices up my um, imagination I make a piece of artwork out of it occasionally I get really lucky and somebody buys a piece I do not, I, I don't know that I've really ever actively pursued my art as a commercial venture. Uh, I've had some good sales over the years, um, but it was, it, 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 to me it's about self-satisfaction, self-exploration. -exp you know, you test the limits of your capacity. Now to wrap this show up today, we're gonna to meet up with Jared Lees. Now this guy makes custom made cutlery knives and they are amazing and they're beautiful. I don't know if you should hang them on the wall and look at them or actually use them. Let's go see what Jared Lees knives are all about. Back in 2017 is when I made my first knife. This is February, 2017 and uh, it was Kind of by accident. I had been putting handles on knives before that um, that were already made, but that kind of just led to me finding resources to figure out how to make my own knife. I have no history of metalwork before this. I'm a bass player and I've always carried a knife. Um, I got onto Instagram. Instagram is really bad for people's wallets. Um, because I tend to, I was following a bunch of knife makers. I'm like, that looks like fun. So I kind of basically, because I always carried a knife um, and thought knives were cool and started seeing other people making knives. Um, that's kind of what made me decide to get into it. And 
I didn't think it was going to be anything that lasted for more than, you know, one or two knives. And I made a knife, and because of my being a musician, I had kind of a decent following from that. And people were giving me money after I made like two knives. So I've been figuring out how to do it ever since. I primarily make um, chef knives. Santokus are, a, you know, like a Japanese style chef knife, and those seem to sell really well. And occasionally I make, you know, small everyday carry knives or hunting knives. I've made a couple big, um, you know, camp knives like kukris and uh, Bowie knives and a couple things like that. But not, that's not my typical order. My typical order is for kitchen cutlery. The process usually starts with just a, a bar of steel uh, and it's forged to shape uh, as close as possible and then I'll do a little bit of refining on the grinder just to clean up some of the edges and some of the just a little bit of the profile of the knife. Uh, after that it's heat treated. After it's all heat treated uh, it's to the grinder again to, to clean up the bevels. Most of my customers like a rustic forged finish look so I leave some of the forge marks along the spine of the knife. So it's, the bevels are ground clean and as close to zero as possible. Which zero being the measurement, it's down to nothing. Um, and after that, it is hand sanding the blade, which takes uh, a couple hours sometimes. Depends on how, on how hard the steel is. Different steels are easier to uh, sand than others. Some of them, I just worked with Crew, for v, Crew Forge V and it was awful to sand. It took like three and a half hours to do the whole knife, which it usually takes me like an hour and a half for most of the steels that I use. After the blade is hand sanded, I attach a handle and sculpt the handle. Once again, I use the belt sander to do most of the sculpting on the handle. And then it's hand sanding the handle so it feels just right and it's smooth. And then it's finishing it with um, an oil and then uh, final finish with the wax. Uh, and then after that, it sits around for a few days and I look at it and inspect it and make sure I'm happy with everything. Um, and then once I'm happy with it, I sharpen it, package it up, and ship it out to the customer. I make my knives, I want them to be sharp. To me, knives are not pry bars, they're not screwdrivers, they're cutting tools. So I, I tend to make, especially for the kitchen knives, the geometry of the blade is thin and I hand sharpen each knife on a set of water stones to get the edge perfectly across the board without ruining the heat treatment or anything. Sometimes when people, oh, they sharpen their knives on a belt um, or a belt sander, uh, the, the blade gets hot and you ruin the temper of the steel. So I, I do everything cold with water stones and it, it gives it an edge that cuts as good as anything you'll find out there. Being a bass player has been awesome for me being a knife maker because basically without the help of my bass guitar building buddies out there, I, I don't know how I would have gotten up to speed because they've sent me so much wood to use for the handles of knives and, and that's really, they were the way I was able to get started because my, my initial uh, startup costs weren't that much. So it's just kind of been acquiring more tools as I go over time. but. Really, the metalworking thing, um, my ties to it are, are, are kind of minimal. I found out after I started making knives that my, grandfa my great grandfather was a blacksmith, and my grandfather had a tool sharpening business on the side when he was uh, younger, and I didn't know anything about that stuff until after I started making knives. I always tell people that you're not just buying a knife for yourself, you're buying a knife for your grandchildren. If you take care of my knives, um, they, they should last your lifetime and into the next. And you know, it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's, it's just a tool that if you take care of it, it'll take care of you. I have a couple customers that have come to me for repairs for knives that were like their grandparents' knife, you know, old old French chef's knife or an old German chef's knife and they just want it kind of cleaned up or maybe the handle is starting to break a little bit but the blade was still fine um, you know and, and it just needed a little TLC. Uh, you hear of 
these samurai swords that are from, you know, the 1700s still being around. So, you know, these definitely can last a lifetime, if not more. Thank you once again for watching this episode of Around Akron with Blue Green. Now, if you have any questions or comments or you just want to drop me an email, you can go to www.aroundakronwithbluegreen.com or you can find me on Instagram and on Facebook. Thank you and have an amazing day. Hey, out there, Akronites. Thank you for joining me here in my den of Akron, as I like to call it, where I think about what I'm going to do for next episodes. Do reset. Better than Take two. Hey, out there. Hey, out there, Akronites. Welcome once again to Around Akron with Blue Green. Now, thank you for joining. I take a trip. I take a trip down to Blueberry Hill to visit. I take a trip down to Blueberry Hill to visit the Wizard Grizzle of wizard <laughs> that'll be outtakes I take a trip down to Blueberry Hill